Year Two, The Rule of Vox Nihili. From the Journal of Vox Nihili, Settlement Leader Pro Tem, Entry Number Three. I ask myself every day why I agreed to come to this place. Bob the Third, the leader of the expedition, and only one with any real power here, says we came to exploit the incredible natural resources of the land. Yes, there is dolomite under the ice that is bound to be full of iron and flux, and, and sure, we've already struck rich veins of gold. The cave spiders here weave more web than anywhere I've seen. But to build a settlement here, when there's no fresh water, no lumber, no soil, it's utter madness. We're hundreds of miles from our homeland, and even after a full year of work, we've managed to dig out a third-rate hole in the mountain. Nemo's death is still heavy on my mind. She was a close friend, one of the reasons I allowed myself to come to this place. She came along on this trip enthusiastically, wanted to bag a woolly mammoth or an ice drake. Instead, she managed to shoot down a giant mole and a troglodyte before being swarmed and torn apart by the resident Batmen. Speaking of the Batmen, they're everywhere, and they live in alliance with the giant cave swallows. Both harry us at every turn. We never did recover Nemo's bones, which froze solid and slid into the rift that cuts this forsaken mountain in two. Without her crossbow and bolts, we dare not make war with the resident monsters. Bob the Third, Ticklehug, and Rinspring had begun digging a tunnel towards the dolomite deposits in the north, crossing over the rough bridge that spans the rift. I ordered them to stop smoothing out the twenty bedrooms they dug, and instead work on finding some resources in this place. Now, we might even have some farmable stone in a year or two if we can focus. From the Journal of Vox Nihili, Settlement Leader Pro Tem, Entry Number 4. Rinsbrain is dead, pushed into the rift by a Batman. Rinsbrain tish ish listast, minor, cancels dig, interrupted by Batman. Rinsbrain tish ish listast, minor, has fallen into a deep chasm. Perhaps the damn bridge wasn't such a good fucking idea, Spoon Boy. You and Bob the Third will have us all dead by the end of this year. By the fell detective, two of my three close friends here are already dead. Armorer Vox Nihili Boss and Iden was is friends with Nemo, Rinsbrain, Ticklehug, and long-term acquaintances with Squaw Spoon Boy and Bob the Third. Oh, and good luck recovering the pick from the bottom of the rift. I swear I will do everything I can to keep the surviving five alive. I'm not a believer in blood spilt needlessly. I craft armor, not weapons. I worship the goddess of music and poetry, not at war. Atith Poemhumd is a deity of the Gate of Climaxes. Atith most often takes the form of a female dwarf and is associated with youth, longevity, dance, music, revelry, and festivals. From the Journal of Vox Nihili, Settlement Leader Pro Tem, Entry Number 5. Today, Ticklehug, my last friend in this place, was taken by a giant cave swallow on the far side of the rift. The thing moved with unworldly speed and tore her apart in a flurry of ink-black feathers. She managed to swing her pick once or twice, barely scratching the beast. Her body sits in pieces, partially consumed on the far side of the rift. The beast that murders her guards her mutilated corpse and taunts us with its calls. We dare not fight it on the bridge with only the four of us remaining. Ticklehug worshipped Egal, god of the wind, and came to this place to be closer to his cold essence. She did not deserve to die this way. Today, I will convince Bob the Third that we must abandon this place and head back to the mountain home. There is nothing left for me here. From the Journal of Vox and Ihali, Settlement Leader, Pro Tem, Entry Number 6. I called for a meeting with Bob the Third and told him it was time for us to leave, but he would have none of it. I left angrier than I've ever been. I am... 
very unhappy. I have no hope of surviving this endeavor. Bob the Third seemed equally upset, but was far too stubborn to give up yet. Vox Nihilai Bosoniden has been very unhappy lately. He yelled at someone in charge lately, but only got angrier. He's lost a friend to tragedy recently. He admired a fine trap lately. He slept without a proper room recently. He was disgusted by a miasma lately. He's complained of the lack of chairs lately. He's been satisfied at work lately. With no hope of leaving, I ordered a solid door be constructed to keep out the rift creatures. The door has been locked and forbidden. From the Journal of Vox Nihili Settlement Leader Pro Tem, entry number 7, an elven caravan somehow found its way to this place. We traded some mechanisms for wooden furnishings, fisherberry wine, and some bloated tubers. The idiot elves were thrilled with the trading, utterly fascinated by the simple mechanisms we gave them. I can't wait for them to freeze to death or leave. In addition, I disabled the front door mechanism lever link and had it replaced with two solid doors that didn't require someone pulling a lever in the back of the settlement to close out the troglodytes. Perhaps... We'll live to see a second summer in this place. From the Journal of Vox Nihilai, Settlement Leader Pro Tem, entry number 8. Migrants! Twenty fools straight out of the mountain home made their way here. Perhaps they were led to believe that Syrup Leaf would be a dwarven utopia, a place of excess and celebration. If only. This place is likely to be our tomb, now, more than ever, how can we hope to feed so many with so little? I'll have to set up a butcher shop to make use of our draft animals, a kitchen so we can cook our useless seeds, a still to brew what few plants we have, seven plump helmets and five bloated tubers, <laughs> before some starving idiot eats them. Unfortunately, the migrants did not realize the danger that exists in this place and headed straight for the entrance, right past the gaping open half of the rift. Suddenly, a giant cave swallow, who happens to be male, appears. Fortunately, these dwarves did not prove to be the coddled pleasure hunters I'd expected. A Batman appears and is badly injured with brain damage. They even slay another Batman we named earlier. A Bon Atholatsul's corpse lies on the ice. They killed several Batmen and drove off a giant cave swallow, only to have more Batmen follow them directly into the fort. Our one brave peasant fights a Batman inside while a second Batman attacks the elven traders. However, one migrant flees over the glacier and is brought low, another corpse that we may never recover. There are 23 of us now. However, we only have one skilled miner, have lost one pick, and another is still guarded by a giant cave swallow. Fortunately, we brought a fourth, just in case, and I hope to train additional miners, masons, and crafters. When the next caravans arrive, we will have more than a few mechanisms to trade. That is, assuming we don't all starve to death first. From the Journal of Vox Nihili, Settlement leader pro tem entry number nine i fear the end is near our supplies are dwindling even now hungry mouths consume the last of our pickled turtles and salted plump helmets the estimates bob the third makes are optimistic personally i counted some two plump helmets five bloated tubers and 15 turtles remaining amongst a few bits of meat this would have fed the four of us for months but will be depleted quickly by our 23 current residents. Perhaps, perhaps some measures might be required. First, though, I order that our surviving draft animals be butchered, along with a few of the weaker-looking puppies. Our new tannery, kitchen, still, and butcher shop will yet keep us alive, and in summer, perhaps a human caravan will bring warm tidings and warmer food. Skaw, one of the original seven to set out to this place, was taken by a mood. 
and created our settlement's first true artifact, a tower cap statue. Linon Tashem, the continent of pulling, a tower cap statue. This is a tower cap statue. All craft dwarf ship is of the highest quality. It is decorated with tower cap. This object menaces with spikes of tower cap. On the item is an image of hippos in tower cap. Perhaps hunger prompted him to carve images of fat, delicious looking hippos on the side. I begin to wonder just how much nutritional content tower caps might have. From the Journal of Vox Nihili, Settlement, Leader, Pro Tem, Entry Number 10. It is summer now, and the situation worsens. Our intrepid residents have recovered most of Ticklehug's remains, though unfortunately her skull will probably never be found. Her remains were interred in the most respectful tomb we can construct, given the current situation. With her pick and the spare in our stockpile, we outfitted two unskilled peasants to work as apprentice miners to Bob the Third. They have started a massive project to tunnel magma from the nearby vent under the frozen fresh water springs and brook nearby. Bob the Third says Nur will give them strength to preserve. Nur, the special glitter, is a deity of the Gate of Climaxes. Nur most often takes the form of a male dwarf and is associated with thunder, lightning, the rain, storms, and consolation. Personally, I feel his useless god holds no sway over this place, where dark clouds linger always, but neither rain nor snow ever fall. Meanwhile, misfortune continues to mock us ceaselessly, Rick Xuan managed to get bitten by a highly venomous cave spider, though he's expected to survive. Hurish is attacked by a Batman while gathering webs out by the rift. Fortunately, he proves to be more of a dwarf than he looked and punished the creature mercilessly until it finally breathed its last. I fear all of this is meaningless, though we've stabilized our food supply for the moment, by killing most of our animals, our drink cache is running dry. The last of our plants have been brewed, and the last of the fisher wine from the elves has been polished off. Only a barrel of tuber beer remains, and the dwarves fight over drinking rights now. It's late summer, by my measure, and the human caravan has not come. The others do not know it yet, but I feel this is the end. Despair grips me. Vox Nihili, Bassanidin, has been very unhappy lately. He cried on somebody in charge lately and felt a little better afterwards. Bob the Third may be a poor leader, but I feel she, at least, understands our situation now. I do not hold her entirely at fault. Entry number 11. Our miners have pierced the magma pipe, no casualties. A glimmer of hope to some, but not I. I know the speed at which magma moves, and I know also that by the time the brook thaws, we will be drinking each other's blood for sustenance. The other day I swore I saw a troglodyte fighting a sand raider of all things in the distance. Later only a pool of frozen blood and a corpse could be found. I pray that we have not been discovered by a powerful, savage nation of this region. Entry number 12. What follows is a diagram of the brook melting magma tunnel. It has already experienced multiple failures, seems the miners were unable to prevent the tunnel from being exposed to the ice. Obviously the magma hit the ice and melted it, then solidified into obsidian. A second route was channeled from above using a special emergency tunnel, but this one pierced the rift and began hemorrhaging our precious magma into the depths. An emergency wall was built in the rift to patch this, but much time has been lost. The magma is weeks away from breaching the brook, and we have less than five units of drinks remaining. Already many go thirsty. Blue arrows indicate thirsty dwarves. Bob the Third herself is thirsty. I felt a madness gripping at me, tearing at my mind. No drinks left. Magma too slow. No drinks left. Caravan coming soon. No drinks left. All my friends dead. No drinks left. No gods left. No hope left. Water. Everyone. Solid. Hard. 
undrinkable, a good flagon of ale, a barrel of wine, a mug of beer, I, a cup of ale, that's the stuff, they laugh at me, why, none of them have drinks either, unless, no, 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 my friend Spoonboy would tell me if there was anything to be had, oh, oh, yes, Oh, Atlith, where is your revelry in this place? I will have none of them at it. None of them. I must be alone. I will be alone. What's that? You have a job for me? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Box Nihiline Bossanide and Armor. Cancel store item in stockpile. Taken by Mood. Box Nihiline Bossanide and Armorer. Withdraws from society. Excerpt from the official journal of the Caravan of the Mountain Home. Today we came upon the settlement of Syrup Leaf, hoping to take on great loads of food and drink from the settlement. My initial impression of the landscape is that of a blighted arctic wasteland. Though the undead tread not here, thankfully, there are mighty creatures that even our sturdy guards dare not face. We were fortunate, though, and were confronted by but a single Batman, whom we dispatched with ease. We reached the depot, but no dwarves came forth to trade. The liaison fearfully heads inside the simple yet solid doors of the place to seek out the expedition leader. It seems he's too confused by thirst to make meaningful conversation and fails to give us any sort of import orders. The liaison warms him that this is very unusual and counterproductive. Remember, Trade agreements strengthen bonds. Please consider an import agreement next year. It seems that their leader Pro Tem has withdrawn from society, demanding an anvil with which to complete some sacred metalwork of his god. Fortunately, some peasant or other was cognizant enough to bring out piles of trade goods. It seems this place is not the paradise we hoped for, but the massive hoard of stone and bone baubles and mechanisms they offer will go for many times their price in nearby human towns, so we trade. They purchase every drop of drink we brought with us, and the vast majority of our food stocks as well. It's all we can do to keep enough to survive off for the journey back. What happens next will be burned into my mind forever. Some two dozen desperately thirsty dwarves swarm out of the front gate to the depot, leaping upon the barrels of purchased booze and consuming them with great gusto. They also purchase some steel armor and two iron anvils, in addition to some other odds and ends. We make an excellent profit and quickly pack up. I look forward to making this trip again, if only for the profits. The dwarves here are hardly a friendly and welcoming bunch. As we left, I heard shouts from within the settlement. The afflicted dwarf had completed his project, pounding out a gold bar purchased from our caravan against an anvil with his bare hands. Ethnitam Vezinar, Desert Vision, the Spry Rawness, a Golden Low Boot. This is a Golden Low Boot. All craft warship is of the highest quality. It is studded with gold, decorated with fox leather, and encircled with bands of turtle bone. Apparently, the dwarf's depression and dehydration has led him to visions of his god. This desert vision allowed him to craft a great work indeed, a gold boot worth 92,400 coin. Perhaps next year this place will have even more to offer us if their success doesn't bring unwelcome attention from the resident frost giants. And those that will not be spoken of first. As we leave, I notice that the solid ice on the surface of their natural spring had turned to liquid water, an oasis in a desert of ice. From the Journal of Vox Nihili, Settlement Leader, Pro Tem, Entry Number 12, I am thankful for Athleth's guidance in having me craft the second truly sublime piece of artistry in this place. Though I wish she had stayed her hand until after we'd finished our deal with the trade caravan. While everyone else was drinking, I was waiting for someone to put together a workshop with one of the anvils we'd purchased. I almost perished waiting, but who can blame the dwarves for drinking their fill after weeks of waiting? Since the completion of my artifact, things here have returned to normalcy. The water-collecting tunnel is not going as well as we'd hoped, 
Apparently, thawing only a small part of the spring means most of the source water remains trapped. However, it is slowly making its way down to the cistern, until the river refroze. Yes, the temperature fell so far that even with a tube of magma directly under the spring, it returned to a state of solid ice. In other news, a cobalt thief was seen trying to make its way into our settlement, but was immediately chased off. Seems at least two civilizations will be attempting to steal from us in the future. Entry number 13. A vile force of darkness has arrived. Spawn of holistic wrestler, male, looms over the horizon, along with a horde of its cohorts. Our past problems are nothing. They have come to this place. Those that haunt dreams, the half-dwarves, the living dead demons of another place, the lowly but fierce spawn of the ever-fallen holistic detective. They come with no weapons, for their useless, regrown claws of hands could never hold anything meaningful. They come without clothes or armor. But imagine the fear that must have struck in our lookout. Imagine seeing the sixteen or so creatures with their mottled gray, hairless, and naked, twisted flesh. Their massive, slobbering maws where once was a mouth, taking up the entire space where, their, where a normal dwarf's face would be. Their eyes and nose pushed bizarrely to the sides of their freakish head. Oh, but their mouth... Oh, what teeth, their mouth. They have no chin, nor true beard, though long, spindly hairs grow both within and outside of the gaping hole in their head. Teeth line the gullet, growing first deep in the throat and covering the entire inside of the mouth, with several exposed through what remains of the monster's lips. It is said that when the god Nemo fought the fell god beast holistic detective, Nemo struck off both her hands, then slashed her face open along the mouth with his obsidian blade. Holistic Detective then used her now horribly enlarged mouth to tear Nemo in half, then descended to hell, taking her rightful place at the head of the demons there. Now, her horrific descendants plague the land, conquering fortresses and towns alike, breeding madly like animals and consuming any who oppose them. And now, they have arrived here. I called together a small vanguard consisting of seven dwarves, Bob the Third, Kennel, Lackloss, Royal W, Holistic Detective, Luigi's Discount, and Skaw. Skaw and Lackloss carry axes. Bob the Third, her trusty pick. What little armor we have is placed on Skaw, as only he is armed with both a proper weapon and the strength to wield it to full effect. The eight war dogs not posted at the front gate mill around at their heels as they form a thin hallway between the entrance and the center meeting area. The enemy closes quickly, moving with the speed of demons. I order the front doors locked, but the cobalt thief had toyed with the mechanisms, and a dwarf had to run outside to check their function before they could be fully locked. Not that it mattered. A diorite door has been destroyed by a spawn of holistic wrestler. The other door has also been destroyed. Two war dogs have been struck down. Our guard dogs fell instantly, and those inside get a glimpse of the invaders. The combat dwarves stand nervously, unsure of themselves, waiting for the order to charge forward into the frothing masses of demon flesh. Most of them are unarmed. None are trained with their weapons save Bob the Third. The demons cannot bleed, nor feel pain, nor do they know fear though it is said that a blow to their digestive organs can paralyze them momentarily as they vomit forth their foul meals. I consider briefly those who have lived and died under their horrible reign, then resign myself to my fate. I give the order. As our troops sprint back inside, three masons leap forth, stones in hand, and build a defensive wall at the speed only a dwarf can manage. The monsters outside cannot break through such engineering as this, and we are now prisoners in our own fort. I hear the creatures outside destroying the trade depot. I'd hoped not to have to give this order. Hoped against hope.
Swift death at the hands of demons is preferable to slow starvation any day, but certain death will never top even the slimmest chance of survival. I hang my head in shame. A short final update with images of the fort and the uploaded file should come later. I swear I did not expect these guys to siege so soon. I set them so that goblins or sand raiders should have sieged just long before they did. My artifact must have just pushed them over the edge or something. From the Journal of Vox Nihili, Settlement Leader Pro Tem, Entry Number 14. The dwarves are restless. We've already been shut inside this place for months, and peeks through the mortar have revealed that the demons are still in place, waiting. Some seem to be suffering from severe frostbite, but I doubt that they mind, being that pain is a concept nearly as foreign to them as mercy. I realize, though, why they have come, despite the fact that our settlement is only in its second year. The trade caravan sent out word of the glorious artifact I crafted, and this single treasure is enough to attract these loathsome beasts from whatever land they came from. So ultimately, it is I who brought doom to our humble settlement. Thus, I cannot in good conscience continue my reign. I will, however, document the current progress of the fort before passing the torch. Here, we see the progress of the water towards our cistern. Clearly, a larger area under the spring must be filled with water, but as we cannot go outside, this is impossible. However, at least, it is moving forward. The magma is filling up the tunnels under the Tubi dugout metalworking facility quickly. I am dismayed at how long it has taken to put this project together, but it should bloom quickly if we do not all starve to death first. Here we see the plans for the smithing area above the former schematic. Next, I have planned out a massive crafting sector in addition to the large area of the lower middle level worker housing. Hopefully, the following rulers can complete both the housing and crafting areas. The final image shows the upper level of our fortress. One can see our successful mining projects in the north, as well as planned noble administrative offices and housing space in the south. Though offices have yet to be set up, I made preliminary assignments to the offices of manager and treasurer to Skull Buggy and Murder Mystery, respectively. Both will be expected to fulfill their current jobs and their administrative work in the future. The office of sheriff remains vacant, and no jail has been set up. If we would fight amongst ourselves, I doubt we would have even the slimmest hope against the fiends that hold us hostage in our own settlement. Here is the final summary, which includes extremely rough estimates. I have no idea how the figure of 67,000 was reached for imports, but everything else looks about correct. Good luck to whomever takes up the mighty task that I leave to them. One final piece of advice. Keep cooking our useless seeds. It might keep us alive just long enough.